In LA this week. On this 50th anniversary of the Watts Revolt, various LA communities speak face to face with LAPD officers about the very sensitive topic of police shootings. I'm Gil Reyes in Koreatown with a story. I'm Anna Marcos. Shop with a cop? That's exactly what these kids and cops are doing as they get ready for school. More on this coming up. A call to ground drones in certain areas to keep them from interfering with fighting wildfires. Next. Hello and welcome to LA This Week. Thanks for joining us. I'm Yana Kay. Our top story this week, it was 50 years ago this month. A routine traffic stop sparked one of the deadliest riots in L.A. history. The Watts Revolt eventually led to reforms, including better schools and health services for African-American communities. But as Gil Reyes reports, many people of color aren't satisfied. Fifty years after the Watts Rebellion, African Americans mentioned some of the progress made in their community. There are more black business owners, a black president in the White House, but there's still a long way to go to equality. From the unemployment to housing to the wealth gap between our communities. And most importantly, the two most important, when you look at the criminal justice system, mass incarceration, and still police tensions. Earl Ofari Hutchinson of the L.A. Urban Policy Roundtable says the number of African Americans in prison has soared to more than half a million people. That's more than 14 times the number than in 1965, the year of the riots. Making things worse, recent incidents of unarmed suspects, many of them people of color, killed by law enforcement nationwide. Many say unnecessarily. It's a wake-up call, a continuing wake-up call. Meantime, over in Koreatown, LA's Korean-American community hosted this Days of Dialogue event, where members of the Korean-American community urged the LAPD to be more transparent with their on-body camera footage. We're not really building a lot of community trust when the police act like they have something to hide. Others in these roundtable discussions say trust could be improved with more minority hirings at the LAPD more bilingual and bicultural police officers who can speak the API languages and who understands the culture, I think that will also improve the relations as well. Again, welcome. Uh, the dialogue continued near South LA's mostly Latino neighborhoods. Crime has gone down, but I feel like uh, policing is still the same. If they still discriminate us. Um, you call them and they take forever. It, it can be a life or death matter, but because of the area you're calling from, I feel like we just don't get the attention. But one of the ways that we can do change better is to have understanding and to come together and have these conversations. Mm -hmm. Days like today are a great opportunity for us to learn from the community and learn how we as a police department can do things just a little bit better. To improve life for all of us 50 years later. In Watts, Gil Reyes for LA This Week. The Watts Rebellion claimed the lives of 34 people and caused more than $40 million in property damage. While those riots led to changes such as health care reform in L.A.'s African-American communities, most notably with the opening of Martin Luther King Jr. Hospital in Willowbrook. Nearly a decade after it was forced to close, MLK is back, and some say better than ever. Gil Reyes has more. It's a new day at MLK. After an eight-year absence, Martin Luther King Jr. Community Hospital is officially back. That means residents in Watts, South LA, and surrounding communities won't have to travel far for basic medical care. And you're talking about the Watts riot. The riot because we was hurting. We was hurting and we didn't have nothing. The hospital in Willowbrook opened in 1972 in response to the Watts riots and national protests demanding equal rights for black America. But the government shut MLK down in 2007 following complaints of poor patient care. L.A. County Supervisor Mark Ridley Thomas promised to bring it back and he delivered. It means that we can respectfully tip our hats to the past, savor the present moment, and embrace the future and all of its potential and possibility plus its promise. Indeed, we ought to be grateful. I am so excited to be here at the opening of Mark Ridley Thomas Hospital. <laughs> there, 
It's a new key at MRT. <laughs> Say it with me. The new MLK is a different hospital. Gone is the old trauma center. There are also fewer beds, but in their place are an expanded outpatient clinic, a psychiatric care unit, and a new public health center where patients can receive immunizations and STD testing. The new focus is on smart, less expensive preventive treatment, a hospital for the era of Obamacare. We was here when we didn't have nothing, and now we're here with something. This is a new day. A new day at MLK. In Willowbrook, Gil Reyes for LA This Week. MLK is also expected to open a recuperative care center for homeless patients in the fall. Well, a call to action in LA as the Southern Christian Leadership Conference marked the 50th year anniversary of the Voting Rights Act. At stake, the rights of minorities and others at the polls as certain states enact new voting laws. Anna Marcos explains. <laughs> It was a turning point in history. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 gave blacks and other minorities the right to vote. But it came after much struggle and even the loss of life during the civil rights movement. Now, 50 years later at this anniversary event in L.A., Councilmember Marquise Harris Dawson and others urge a new kind of struggle as Congress considers laws to stop voter discrimination in some states. I say to all the activists, I say to all the people who care about these issues, huddle, get together, get organized, stay organized, but first and foremost, disrupt the status quo, push us towards progress, and don't sit down, don't shut up, don't stop disrupting. Voter rights advocates say the Supreme Court crippled the Voting Rights Act two years ago. At the time, the court struck down parts of the law, which require states with a history of racial discrimination to get an okay from the feds before changing voter laws. That move opened the door for several states, including Alabama, to create stricter voter ID requirements and other laws that target minorities, the poor and the elderly. Congress is now working on new amendments to restore those voter protections. It, it is really a time to make some changes, and we have to make those changes. For Mayor Eric Garcetti, voter barriers spill beyond the voting booth and into the streets in places where people struggle with racism, homelessness, and joblessness. So if we're interested in voting rights, let us work to keep the laws we have fought for and to expand the opportunities for those who don't have them today. If we think racism isn't alive in this country, look to Charleston. Go to Skid Row. The Voting Rights Advancement Act of 2015 would also give the feds more authority in the courts on voting matters and in requesting federal observers at the polls. I'm Anna Marcos for LA This Week. The Southern Christian Leadership Conference of Southern California works to improve the conditions of poor and underserved populations. While a grassroots effort to battle South LA's crack cocaine epidemic has grown to inspire so much more. Gil Reyes reports from the 25th anniversary of the Community Coalition. South LA's Community Coalition marked a quarter century of service with singing, cheering, and the opening of an all new center. Community Coalition was founded by former doctor's assistant Karen Bass, who'd go on to serve in the state legislature and now in Congress. Taking aim at crack cocaine, her group originally focused on drug treatment and housing for addicts, then grew to also advocate for foster children, while pressuring the LA School Board to pour more money into the maintenance of South LA schools. For leading the way, one of the new meeting rooms at the center is named after Congresswoman Bass. Nothing brought me the joy that I felt every day that I work at Community Coalition. And I'm always so honored that you asked me to come back and you asked me to visit. And now you named something after me? <laughs> Let me just thank you 
Thank you from the bottom of my heart. To have these headquarters here means you don't have to go downtown or West LA to see one of the finest organizations work right here in the heart of LA. We hope that a lot of community centers are inspired by this project. Community Build is doing a project just down the street. Uh, Crenshaw Christian Center, also down the street, is talking about programs. And so we're very excited about what could happen here on Vermont in the 8th District. And what could happen over the next 25 years for a coalition that's thrived with the help of volunteers and donations. In South LA, Gil Reyes for LA This Week. Besides Congresswoman Bass, new 8th District Councilman Marquise Harris Dawson also got his political start as an activist with the Community Coalition. While lawmakers from all levels of government are banding together to fight a threat they say creates a danger in the sky, unmanned drones have already threatened firefighting efforts, and owners of the flying gadgets might soon find they are in a no-fly zone. Anna Marcos has the story. When a wildfire flares up, L.A. fire helicopters and aircraft take to the skies. But in ever-growing numbers, firefighting aircraft are getting grounded by a new threat in the air, drones, also known as unmanned aircraft systems. The United States Forest Service has tallied 13 wildfires in which drones interfered with firefighter and aircraft this year. Although drones are used for police work, movie filming, and for other commercial reasons, more and more drone owners are now private hobbyists. More than two million drones were sold last year, with sales up 50 percent this year. City leaders have teamed up with state and federal lawmakers to come up with laws to stop the drones near wildfires and near areas like LAX. After several near misses just in the past few weeks, in which drones have been piloted above active wildfires, grounding tankers full of fire retardant, it's clear we have a major problem. According to the Federal Aviation Administration, there are nearly 200,000 aircraft in the sky in the U.S. at any one time. Potentially, that means drones could outnumber aircraft in our skies as we speak. Luckily, L.A. firefighters say they have not had to deal with drone interference yet. But in neighboring San Bernardino, firefighting efforts were grounded recently due to drones in the Cajon Pass fire. The presence of drones in the fire in the Cajon Pass allowed for the fire to spread because whenever drones are sighted near a fire site, the, the crew has to issue a complete ground stop. Which Someone could have lost their life and that we cannot uh, stand for and will not stand for. Both state and federal leaders are now drafting regulations. The state laws could take effect later this year. I'm Anna Marcos for L.A. This Week. And the community of Pacoima gets ready for El Nino. As Gil Reyes reports, a water storage system in the works aims to take advantage of the expected heavy rainfall. Whenever there's a major downpour, this stretch of Laurel Canyon Boulevard in Pacoima gets saturated with mud and rainwater. It comes up to my driveway. It's been taking trash cans. My other neighbor on the other side has to go around them and kick them. And I have seen other people falling. That's why homeowner Anna Olvera and her neighbors support a new water recapturing project that aims to turn a negative into a positive. As these before and after photos show, city crews will be beautifying their flood prone sidewalk while adding several underground wells beneath the curb. Officials say the system will be able to collect up to 13 million gallons of stormwater each year. That's 13 million gallons of water less that we've got to purchase. It's 13 million gallons of water that's going to go to work right here in our community. Area Councilman Felipe Fuentes and company call it the Laurel Canyon Boulevard Green Street Project. Water will then be diverted to the San Fernando Groundwater Basin for future use instead of out into the ocean. The project expected to be completed in February 2016. And if you believe the preliminary weather reports in time for the tail end of the upcoming El Nino season, which is expected to bring heavy rain across Southern California. We will have at least one or two wells in, in time to capture some of the earlier rains. And then throughout the rainy season, we will work and complete the project. Crews want 11 wells total. The cost about $3 million. And it's a good payoff. It's actually our investment is better than the price that we pay for purchased water. So this has a great payback for the citizens of LA. While saving up for a rainy day. In Pacoima, Gil Reyes for LA This Week.
Right. City crews tell drivers along that stretch of Laurel Canyon to be patient and expect delays when construction begins in September. Well, San Pedro community members and city leaders are taking back their parks and improving neighborhoods by sharing a strong commitment to safety. What's your favorite part of the park? Uh, the tire swing. The tire swing. It's official, the tire swing at the newly renovated Alma Park in San Pedro is hands down the overall favorite among kids who came out recently with their families to cut the ribbon on the new and improved neighborhood park. We will change this city forever. I think we are doing it now. I think we're making the quality of life better. Um, but in its simplest form, it doesn't get any better than opening a new playground in a park. The improvements are part of an ongoing effort among city and community members to improve Alma and Rena parks and make them safer for park goers. Community members say for a long time the park was a hotbed for people drinking, doing drugs and loitering. There was a real um, poor image for our community and uh, we started to feel it in the neighboring uh, houses. But over the last three years the blight has slowly started to disappear thanks to the LAPD, the Department of Rec and Parks and the community working together to make the park a more inviting and safe place. And so far it's worked. More children and young families have begun using the park because of new improvements which include new playground equipment, surfacing new fencing, benches and walkways. The whole mood of this park has changed and it's not only benefited just this park but it's benefited the neighboring uh, community so it's been a win-win for everybody. And city officials want to keep it that way. They're taking a tough stand against anyone who engages in inappropriate behavior at the park. We owe it to the families and the kids and this is our park and we will not put up with any of the nonsense, with any of the knuckleheads who think otherwise. Transforming a park into a place the whole community can enjoy. Well, people in Boyle Heights can breathe a little easier thanks to a new air treatment facility in their neighborhood. As Gil Reyes tells us, it's long overdue. For too long, people have had to endure foul odors coming from this area overlooking downtown 6th Street Bridge. I mean, every major highway crosses through there. Uh, it's surrounded by industry. Uh, the pollution, it's considered one of the most polluted uh, areas in terms of air quality in California. But Boyle Heights Councilman Jose Huizar says that's about to change. The opening of this artsy-looking air treatment facility and greenway space. Where we're taking some of the, the infrastructure that our city needs to build and we're actually going beyond to ensure that um, what we're building actually has a maximum benefit. City leaders say the nearly $18 million project will collect and remove sewer odor and other foul stenches coming from the area. The improvement spurred by a lawsuit filed by South LA residents fed up with neighborhood air pollution. Adjacent to the treatment plant is this greenway space with drought resistant plants, benches and public art inviting visitors to relax and enjoy the new scenery. We're repurposing it so that it creates a destination point. More improvements are coming, including a new soccer park, bike paths, and pedestrian walkways, all connected to a newly restored 6th Street Bridge, another breath of fresh air when those projects finally open in a few years. In Boyle Heights, Gil Reyes for LA This Week. The planned soccer park and its amenities are expected to open in 2019. And as the country commemorated the 50th anniversary of the Watts riots, many took to social media to share their thoughts, pictures, and experiences. That's the focus of This Week in Tweets. Congresswoman Janice Hahn shared where she was on that day, tweeting, On August 12, 1965, I woke up at church camp to the news that riots had broken out and my father had been attacked. Mayor Eric Garcetti posted, We remember those we lost and honor those who became catalysts for change. KCET Artbound posted a pic of the neighborhood burning out of control, tweeting, The Watts riots also reflected unheard voices in the Chicano community. Hashtag Watts 50. Linnell George posted a photo of two women walking around debris from a destroyed building, tweeting, We moved through streets like these. Buildings fell into themselves, so two memories. And that's a look at This Week in Tweets. While a gun safety ordinance becomes law, affordable housing gets a financial boost and getting up close and personal with LA's biodiversity. All these stories and more in City Beat. LA Mayor Eric Garcetti signed into law a gun safety measure that bans the possession of large capacity magazines inside of city limits. This ordinance prohibits the ownership of magazines that hold more than 10 rounds of ammunition. 
The measure was introduced by Los Angeles City Councilman Paul Krikorian and passed in July. When a shooter has to stop and reload, those are precious seconds that can actually result in the preservation of lives that otherwise are lost. That allows law enforcement to get on the scene, it allows for them to stop the shooter, it allows people to go on living. The mayor also announced the expansion of the New Generation Fund, which will bring an additional $50 million to create, preserve and retrofit affordable housing in the city. The fund offers pre-development and acquisition funding through a public-private partnership between the city and a group of banks and community development financial institutions. The mayor, who is working with the Los Angeles Housing and Community Investment Department, said that the public and private sectors must work together to preserve and expand affordable housing. Since its 2008 inception, the New Generation Fund has provided nearly $70 million for the construction and preservation of more than 1,300 affordable apartments. City Council Member Paul Koretz and the LA County Natural History Museum kicked off BioBlitz LA, an effort intended to explore and document plant and wildlife in L.A. Dozens of volunteer citizen scientists will be trained to photograph and share the animals they find on social media, so the scientists at the museum can better understand the different species that live within the human ecosystem to better protect their environment. It is vital to catalog the plants and animals with whom we share Los Angeles, so we know what else we have to lose if we don't take climate change action more quickly. The Department of Recreation and Parks, Councilman Mitchell Englander and community members held a ribbon cutting ceremony for the newly renovated Lazy J Ranch Park Playground in West Hills. The aging playground in the San Fernando Valley has been revamped and now features modern play equipment, accessible ramps, merry-go-round, bucket seat swing areas and rubberized surfacing. Four large shade canopies have also been added to the play area, creating desirable shade for children during hot summer months. A seasoned artist gives us a glimpse into his unique creations, the rhythmic sounds of a Colombian duo soothe the soul, and a controversial musical that targets presidential assassins. That's all in this week's Things to Do. An installation time-lapse video showcases artist Joseph Holtzman's creation at the Hammer Museum. A selection of Holtzman's recent works from 2006 to 2011 is on view now in a space designed by the artist. Drawing upon several decades of his experience as a designer, editor and trendsetter, Holtzman created a site-specific environment at the Hammer that illuminates the artist's unique aesthetic. The exhibit is on display through September 20th at the Hammer Museum, located at 10899 Wilshire Boulevard. For more, visit hammer.ucla.edu. Journey through space and time with Lula Cruza, the South American duo boldly embracing the intersection of electronic and folk music traditions. Lula Cruza has been on an 18-city tour through the U.S., traveling throughout the Pacific Northwest and West Coast. On August 22nd, they'll be closing out the tour in L.A. at the beautiful Terragram Ballroom with the human experience, Sorne and the Dirty Diamond. This is a rare opportunity to catch Lula Cruza while they're in the U.S. Hailing from Colombia and Argentina, their raw performances have garnered a reputation for transporting audiences with their intimate, meditative qualities. Check them out at the Terragram Ballroom located at 1234 West 7th Street. For more, visit lulacruza.com. Disturbing, alarming, and eerily funny, Assassins is perhaps one of the most controversial musicals ever written. Stephen Sondheim, the great genius of contemporary musical theater, with standout shows such as Sweeney Todd, Into the Woods, and Company, leads audiences on a tuneful review of presidential assassins and would-be killers from John Wilkes Booth to John Hinckley. Thought-provoking and darkly delightful, Assassins won five Tony Awards in its first revival on Broadway. It's been described as dark, demented humor, as horrifying as it is hilarious. The curtain goes up starting August 22nd and runs through September 27th at the Pico Playhouse, located at 10508 West Pico Boulevard. For more, visit assassinsmusicalla.com. And that's a look at some things to do. 
It's back to school for many kids, and most will be picking up school supplies with their parents. But one program in South L.A. has the kids spending quality time shopping with a cop. Anna Marcos takes us on the shopping spree. These kids from South L.A.'s 77th Street Division are ready to go shop with a cop. We're going to have a lot, of, a lot of fun inside and get you ready for school. So everybody ready to go? Yes, sir. All right, perfect. And with that, the kids head into a local Staples store. Box of colored pencils, two yellow highlighters, pencil sharpener, erasers, more erasers. The Shop with a Cop event helps kids buy school supplies they might not otherwise get. They were picked as the kids most in need from among the junior cadet sharks, an LAPD program at the 77th Street Station, which teaches kids discipline and leadership, as well as new relationships with those who hold a badge and gun. Junior Cadet Sharks, who's captain of 77th Street? Captain Polka! South Los Angeles is very busy, it has a tendency to have a, a lot of crime. These kids are exposed to things that most kids in the United States do not see and it gives them the opportunity to have a positive experience with a Los Angeles police officer. It's just a wonderful thing. Uh, the kids love it. The police officers love it. I feel excited because we, we're, we're going to get free stuff. The kids each get a brand new school backpack and a hundred dollar gift card. So what does a hundred dollars buy? I got paper clips. I got Color pencils, 36 pack, white out. Well, I asked Josh what he would want if he could choose anything in the store, and he chose to get some white out. White out? Okay, good. Yeah, I'll make mistakes. <laughs> but some kids know what they really want gummy worms. You gotta have candy, right? Money for the school supplies comes box. from a private donor, but the officers pay out of their own pockets if the kids go over budget. And with that, the kids are prepped and ready for a brand new school year. The officers hope to do it all again next school semester. I'm Anna Marcos for LA This Week. A total of 25 kids got to shop with a cop. Well, that's going to do it for this edition. I'm Yana Kay, and from all of us here at LA This Week, thanks for joining us. We leave you now with some photos of the Watts riots taken by LAFD photographers. Most of them have never been seen publicly. The negatives were discovered in the City Records Center last year and are now preserved in the city archives. We'll see you back here next week for more of LA This Week.